Welcome to this next episode of Table Talk. Today we have a special guest joining us, Ari Daniel, a science journalist and contributor to NPR's work with captivating storytelling in the realm of science. Mr. Daniel, thank you for being a part of our podcast today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here and feel free to call me Ari. You know. Before we dive into our discussion, could you please introduce yourself to our listeners and share a bit about your background and what led you to pursue a career in science journalism and radio reporting? Sure, yeah. So I don't know how far back you want to go, but I've always been interested in science and in the natural world since I was a boy. And I studied science for a really long time. I majored in biology and math in college. Um, and I was, I, was, I was good in school, and so I stayed in school. For a really long time. I went on to graduate school uh, in, uh, I studied animal behavior for my master's. I trained gray seal pups, how to vocalize on command. And for my PhD, I studied oceanography, but it really was with a focus around marine mammal communication and behavior. And I studied Norwegian killer whales and how they work together to feed on herring and their vocalizations as they do so. Um, so I've always had a, so I've had a long interest in science. Uh, I, I knew that I liked teaching others about science. I liked learning about science. And, um, and I liked the, and I thought the kind of creative aspect around radio might be interesting, but I didn't know anything about it. So I connected with a group that was in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I was working on my degree. And their whole mission, their, this group called Atlantic Public Media, their whole mission was to get new voices into doing radio. And I met with someone from, from that team, someone who's, uh, you know, today a, a good friend of mine. And, um, and she told me about the world of radio. And I was really interested. And around that time, they were starting a new project about science. And they loaned me a microphone. And I went out and interviewed a couple of scientists. And I was hooked. I loved it. That is how I got into doing science radio and and science journalism, and it's something that I've been doing for about the last 16 years. How do you choose your subjects? And what's your process for breaking down complex scientific topics for a general audience? I would say that finding topics, it's a bit of a mix. Um, I look for a lot of stories on my own, and that comes through a few different sources. One is I am always scanning these kind of daily or weekly email alerts that come out from the scientific journals where there'll just be press releases about all the different papers that are being published. And I scan those for, for something interesting. And, and there's always something interesting. Things that kind of catch my interest, that are unique, that I want to report on, that I feel like I haven't heard about, that are intriguing kind of windows into, into the world around us. So that's one source. And then I do a lot of story finding through word of mouth. People tell me about something that seems interesting, and so I'll follow up with that. Um, one person will lead me to somebody else. They'll say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. So a lot of that kind of just informal networking. Sometimes I'll find it through Google searching, you know, just kind of being online and bumping into something that seems interesting. But just being out in the world, I mean, there are stories everywhere. And so it's about kind of turning over stones and trying to find... So is it difficult for you to make these stories for general audience? Yeah, it depends. Certainly there's there can be specialized concepts or terminology or ideas that need to be translated. But that's that's my job is to really find ways to make sure that the topics that I'm covering are are accessible and engaging. And so so that first scan, you know, when I'll when I'll kind of come in, come across something that I think is interesting, that's usually what I try to preserve in the story. Whatever that initial kind of bit of fascination is that I'll have um, because then I, I try to bring that into into my piece. And then when I'm working on a story, I'm trying to think if there's an example. Would it be helpful to provide examples? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's very helpful. For okay. Us. Um, let me think about a story I've done recently. Um, you know, I did a story, I think in the fall, around um, head lice that um, the scientists um, analyzed the head lice that... Uh, 
well, I'm bald, so they don't, they're not in my hair. But you know, these are these are lice that that hold on to people's hair, lay their eggs, and then move between hair in order to to survive. And and people, you know, they'll 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 go in to have them combed out or they'll use special shampoos. So they're an annoyance. But it turns out that you can look at human migrations over the centuries by looking at their genetics because they've been hitchhikers on human hair for a really long time. So the ways in which they've traveled the world mirror the ways that people have traveled the world, which was I just thought was a really interesting idea. Yeah, we think of head lice as being annoying things, but here they are as 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 um, companions. Seeing them in a different perspective. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. And companions in our journey around the world. So so they they had done a dna analysis and a, you know it was a, a sophisticated science analysis but i didn't need to get into the details of that analysis really at the high it was i wanted to to communicate this idea that they're not just a pest but they that they have this other information that's worth sharing and so that's how i kind of brought that particular story to life and when i interviewed the scientist about it i asked her about whether she had had hair lice and she said of course she did and her mom had had them and of course going back generations, we've had hair lice, which is why they've been such a good uh, record. Um, but I will just say a, a good record of our own history. Uh, but I will say, in addition to me finding my own stories, I also will receive story ideas from uh, from my editors. They'll say, can you can you do a piece on this? Or um, I get pitched a lot by by sometimes scientists, sometimes people in press offices at universities, sometimes other sorts of press officers that are reaching out who have ideas for stories. So often the stories will kind of come to me as well. You are a co-recipient of the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Gold Award for your work on glaciers and climate change. Could you tell us about the experience and the impact you believe your reporting had on public awareness of climate issues? Sure. Um, that was that was a really special trip. Um, the trip took me to both Greenland and Iceland. And uh, I did that reporting about a year before our first child, our daughter, was born. So it was powerful, very powerful, to see up close the impact that carbon emissions and climate change are having on glaciers things that are pretty far removed from my day-to-day -day experience, and I think the day-to-day -day experience of most people who would be listening to my stories. So for about a week, I got to camp out alongside a glacier. I mean, we were up on a on kind of the, the um, rocky uh, side of it, but, you know, we'd wake up in the morning and there would be the glacier down in the valley. And the scientists were studying how this glacier had changed. I could tell just by looking across the change, the that, change that, that, that had been happening. Yeah. And we went out on a helicopter one day, and they were dropping a kind of uh, a special kind of thermometer down into the, into the water to measure the temperature. And they showed me how the temperature got, it was cold, you know, near the surface, but then down at depth, it got warmer, so warm that it could melt the glacier from below. So there, there were all these ways that it was just a very visceral experience. I got to walk on a glacier at the very end. We, How can you describe this experience? Uh, it felt like being on another planet. You know, I've walked on ice. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, and so I've, I've, I've had my fair share of snow and ice. Um, but this was just, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful, this, just this ice scape that was going in all directions and it had these, these, had these peaks and valleys and it wasn't just white, it was white and gray and brown. It had picked up some of the dirt that as it's moving through the, you know, as the, as the glacier's moving, it picks up dirt and carries it. So you see the, that material inside, some of it's bubbling, some of it's this like deep turquoise color. There'd be these deep kind of chasms down. Yes, yeah, so you had to be careful, but it was, it was just this incredible thing. And it was, it was moving. Of course, I couldn't feel it moving while I was there, but that it flows, it flows outwards, eventually depositing icebergs in the, in the water. Maybe many people won't have the chance to actually see it. So 
I then need to try to bring that to life. Um, and, and that's the case with, with all the reporting I do. You know, the time that people s share with me to tell me about their experience, the places that I'll get to, I'll have the, the, the privilege to see. These are, these are elements that I then weave into my stories. And, and the scientists that devote their lives to this work are a, are a special bunch. So I mentioned Gordon, this scientist, uh, Gordon Hamilton. Uh, he and I, he was terrific, and he and I got along great in the field, and he even invited me and, and um, my wife to come up and visit him in Maine afterwards. Unfortunately, I never got to take him up on that because several months after that trip to Greenland, he was on a field expedition in Antarctica doing work. He was in a snowmobile, in a vehicle, and his snowmobile tipped into a crevasse and he didn't survive the fall. And it showed me the immense dedication that scientists of all stripes have as they do this work, to go to remote places to bring back data. So, as the former senior digital producer at NOVA, how do you think digital media has transformed science communication? What tools or platforms have you found most effective in engaging with audience? Digital media has transformed science communication immensely. It's created all kinds of new venues for content. And to just give you a very simple example, every radio story that I do lives on the internet in perpetuity. And so there was a time when a radio story would air, and if you didn't hear it, that was it. You don't have another chance to hear it. <laughs> no, Maybe, I think it was probably stored in an archive somewhere, but for the general public to consume it, it wasn't available. And so, so now people can access this. It becomes part of the public record in a way. And so there's that, that to me feels, um, you know, that the work has a kind of endurance, you know, that it's going to last. But then there are all these different formats that are available for creation today. And they kind of democratize the process of making media. You know, there are, and, and on social media, people have the ability to, to share in a way that they didn't. And the news has fundamentally changed in ways that are positive and challenging. You know, I mean, I think the amount of news now, the amount of information that is just constantly pouring out and available is on the one hand good because it allows people who are in places where their story might not be told, it puts the microphone, it puts the video camera, it puts the pen in their hands. Yeah, and but it, does it have a bad side, all this uh, amount of information? I, I, think, I think it's too much news. I mean, I, I'm speaking from the U.S. perspective, but it, it's just, it's this constant, you know, need to like update and, and, a, and, a, and news alerts and constantly updating our feeds. As consumers, it requires a kind of discernment and a kind of control that I think we need to, to learn. You know, I don't think that it just, it doesn't just come. It's not like this paper, the newspaper arrives one day, well, one, one time a day in the morning, or you watch the, the news in the evening once. It's 24 seven. So how do we, how do we control that? And, and when I was at, uh, when I was at Nova, uh, as you mentioned, we were trying all sorts of things short digital videos, full-length films on YouTube, vertical video, Facebook Live, Instagram stories. There are lots of possibilities. And so, you know, you can kind of experiment, but then ultimately it's probably good to, to focus in on, on a couple and to really develop that. Um, and then one of my favorite experiences was getting to produce a couple of Nova Labs which are these online interactive games essentially around particular um, pieces of science content. So I produced the Evolution Lab and the, uh, and the Polar Lab. With the Evolution Lab, it is, it, it was the most, and I, so now it's either that or one of the most visited links on Nova's website. It's in, it's used by, the, the platform was intended for kind of middle and high schoolers and lifelong learners. But to gamify the content, is, was a different way for me to kind of think about communicating science, that you could explore it non-linearly, you could have these experiences that allowed you to engage with the content in a way to solve a puzzle or a problem. So that was fun. And then I also got to help produce our 
Black Hole's iPad app, which was a bit like Angry Birds, but instead of flinging a bird, you would fling a star and try to slingshot it around different celestial targets to navigate their gravity. That was a, that was a lot of fun too. Mr. Daniel, your work often intersects with environmental science. What are some of the most pressing environmental issues you've reported on recently? And how do you see the role of environmental journalists evolving in the face of global challenges like climate change? Yeah, those are, uh, those are important questions, Ina. Um, I, I would say that biodiversity loss is a big environmental issue. It goes hand in hand with climate change and development, but I think it's the loss of the richness of of species on this planet, that texture of animals and plants and fungi and bacteria and you know everything that that makes makes the the world whole that that I'm that I worry about because once it's lost, there's a kind of silence. You know, you can't you can't bring it back easily, even in your imagination. You can remember, oh, there used to be more birds singing here. But after, but if you've only grown up in a world where there aren't as many birds singing, then you don't know what it could be like. You hear stories that almost sound like like fantasy. Um, you know, I, I think another theme that I think is important around around uh, environmental science is the importance of connecting young people with the outdoors. And I see these storytelling and media making. And journalism is a way to do that, you know, to, to bring the outdoors to young people through the content they consume. But the best case is to bring them out into the natural world. Climate change is, of course, a big problem. And I, I was just on a reporting trip in Belize to spend time with a group that studies bats. There's a group of international scientists that every year converge in northern Belize to study all different aspects of neotropical bats in all their diversity. One day I went out with uh, one of the researchers. Uh, she's a PhD student in Canada, but she's from Belize originally, Glisselle Marin. And she is studying bats in different places in the country. And we went to one place that's kind of this secondary forest. There are some original trees there, which are just incredible. But then we drove, there's a protected area, and then we drove out of the protected area, and it was like a line because there was the forest, and then it was just clear-cutting. They had clear-cut the forest to make room for agriculture and had, you know, basically torn down archaeological ruins there had been sites for prehistoric bones. The chemicals were leaching into the cenotes there. So a lot of a lot of very visual damage that was taking place. But of course, there are all these forces that are in play, economic forces, political forces, that reward this behavior, not just in Belize, obviously, but all over the world. It's incredibly important to 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 talk about what's going on, to let people know that this is happening to call out those who are harming the environment in ways that aren't responsible and at the same time acknowledging the complexities involved with these conversations because you can't just say preserving the environment is good and harming it is bad. That is too simplistic of a reduction. Of course, the environment is, is incredibly important and preserving huge swaths of it is also important for planetary health, for human health. Um, you know, I mean, reducing the risk of spillover in terms of disease, that comes from making sure we have whole ecosystems. But it's also important to recognize that communities have economic needs and those need to be balanced with the natural world as well. And the other complexity that I'm aware of is that many countries in the West, I mean, the United States profited and benefited from a lot of environmental destruction. And other countries may be engaging in this practice in order to beef up their own economy or to have these, you know, these real financial needs. 
you know, it's just important to recognize that we benefited from the destruction and extraction of our natural resources. So we can't just say, oh, you can't do that. You know, we have to think about what is, what's a better solution. And we need parties that are willing and interested to engage in those sorts of conversations. Next, you are scheduled to meet with Albanian environmental reporters and civil society representatives. What prompted this visit and what are your goals for this trip? I'm thankful to the U.S. State Department who invited me here to come to Albania to meet with journalists and reporters and the press. And I've gotten to spend some time with the Albanian Center for Quality Journalism. And tomorrow we have a visit planned to Tepelen where I'll work with journalism students on thinking about how to incorporate narrative into their storytelling. Also later this week, there's a digital literacy forum that's being held here in Tirana where colleagues and I will be working with educators and representatives from eight Balkan countries, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Romania, and Serbia to develop lesson plans around digital literacy. And in particular, what I'll be focusing on with a colleague is media and digital literacy, which includes data privacy, social media, source verification, and digital citizenship. So in your view, how do global environmental issues resonate on a local scale in places like Albania? Are there specific stories or themes you are hoping to explore? This is where I, I think narrative can play a strong role in telling stories. I think that I think about that a lot when I'm reporting in the U.S. You know, how do I get people to care about a particular issue or subject? I really lean very heavily into narrative. So it doesn't always happen, but but sometimes people become vulnerable or they open up during an interview in a really special way, and I can tie that to the to the to the science. And in this particular case, the scientist had he he's he grew up half in Japan and half in the US, and he told me about how his love of butterflies really began when he was a boy and his dad would take him out butterfly collecting. And that was a lifelong passion that eventually led to his work as a biologist and as an ecologist in the in the realm of butterflies. And he's got an incredible collection now. But one of the things that but his father helped set in motion what eventually became the central question of this publication that had just come out, which is how butterflies had diversified and spread around the world. And so for me, when I think about how to make a local story or make a thing that might seem niche feel broader, I rely on narrative because those sorts of relationships that people have with their parents or how they got involved or interested in something that led to a lifelong commitment, I think is something that can resonate more broadly with people. So you put together emotions and facts when you produce the story. Yeah, yeah. It's someone's personal story, which often has an emotional element to it, combined with the science itself. Mr. Daniel, what advice would you give to young journalism who are eager to dive into science and environmental reporting? Just dive in. I mean, really, the best thing is to just get started. Because until you do, you, I mean, when this is, a, this, is a, um, this is something that one works on over time, and you get better with time. But the only way to get better is if you practice it. And practicing it means just getting in there and and pitching stories and writing stories and getting feedback. You know, I mean, some of my, I, I mean, I didn't go to school for journalism. So a lot of the the best mentorship that I've received has have been has been from editors that I've had over the years, who've taught me about how to develop the structure of a piece, how to flesh out the narrative components, how to how to use tape that I collect in the in the field, and make it pop in a story to make a scene come alive. These are things that I've learned by working on stories. At the beginning, I was okay. You know, I mean, I felt like I had some aptitude. I certainly had interest, but I wasn't polished in it. And so it just, it took making it, making stories week after week in order to, to get better. That's how it is with everything. That's how musicians learn. That's how poets learn. That's Experience how- Experience and practicing is the best way. That's right, right. I mean, that's how programmers and coders develop. I mean, they, they, 
they learn from others and they practice. So I would say that's a, that that's important. You try it, you do it, you get clips, pitch a lot, find out who you like to work with. You know, you'll find you, you there may be outlets whose work you read and you really admire. So you you work with them. And often that mirrors the experience you'll have. You know, you'll you'll like working with the with the people at that outlet. But 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 sometimes it's not the case. So so find so make sure you're working for groups that support you and that that you, that make you feel like you're getting to to work on meaningful projects and and whose company you like to keep. And one final thing, um, and the other thing is to work on finding your voice. And that's hard. That's hard because, you know, I think we learn in school, you know, there's a particular way to write something. You learn how to write a paper. It's it's often very formal. That's how I learned. You know, you and then especially when writing for radio, you have to kind of unlearn a lot of that. You have to it's more informal writing. And it's about finding how to write on the page in the way that you speak or to make it feel like it's it's you. So finding your voice in terms of how you write it and then how you speak it. Or how you, if you're on camera, how you deliver it, you know, um, that that's also, I think, um, a quest, a noble quest, but to find your voice in the context of, of, the, of all the voices that are out there. And what future projects or stories are you most excited about? Are there any emerging science topics or technologies that you think will dominate environmental news in the coming years? I am very excited to work on the stories that I collected while I was in Belize. It was a terrific week to be there, and there were all of these scientists working on all these different projects with a, such a variety of bats. The bats there, most of them are small. When they have their wings folded up, they're about the size of an egg. You know, they're really tiny and actually quite cute. I mean, they've got these little eyes, furry, you know, and, they, and they're so diverse. They feed on, some feed on nectar, some feed on insects, some feed on fruit, some feed on fish. I mean, they, they go diving in the water. It's really incredible. So I've got a few stories lined up uh, that I'm going to be working on. One on, the, on, on bad immune systems and how they fight off disease and what that might be able to teach us about spillover risk and our own immune system. Um, there's another one. Some, some bats, like the nectar-eating bats, they, when they eat nectar, their glucose levels in their blood go sky high. That would give you or me a diabetic coma or kill us, but the bats are fine. So the scientists are trying to figure out how do they do it? How do they survive such high sugar levels and what applications might that have for human health? So there's, so I'm, 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 and there's, and, and I got so much great scene tape when I was out with them, catching the bats and working on the bats and little bat noises. So I'm very excited to work on that. <laughs> um, so, and uh, we will uh, wait and see uh, in the future about other uh, productions that uh, you will make. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, those will come out hopefully this summer. So there will be the radio piece and then digital stories that will go along with it as well. And those digital stories will have photographs that were taken by Luis Echeverria. Um, and then you asked about emerging science topics or technologies. Climate change is a big problem, as we've talked about, and people are trying to figure out what to do. And I think there are many that feel like we're not going to be able to get the carbon dioxide levels down to where they need to be to get this thing under control. And so there are groups that are trying to come up with, with ideas, new technologies, to combat climate change. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of those kind of innovations and that's going to be a topic that is worth covering. Of course, we shouldn't take our eye off of trying to get emissions down, but I think that's going to be another piece of it. You know, I think the the role of artificial intelligence and ChatGPT, that's another big theme that's emerging. How that plays into environmental news and climate change coverage, I'm not sure yet. It's still evolving, but it's certainly becoming a tool that journalists are will be increasingly using, I think. Yeah, they are using and they will use more and more, I think. That's right. That's right. So I think that's something to keep an eye on and is worth reporting on. It's a tool, just like any other tool, um, that has the power to do a lot of good. But 
it's also something that's very powerful and we need to be cautious about as well. And so I see there's just a kind of growing urgency among scientists and researchers. And finally, I think the other theme that I'm seeing is just an ever-growing urgency among scientists and researchers to do something about our changing planet, to document what's happening, to try to get it under control, and ideally to try to reverse the worst effects of it. Mr. Daniel, thank you for being part of our podcast today and sharing with our listeners important uh, and interesting information about science journalism. It, it was my pleasure, Ina. Thank you so much for having me. What would be a good way for me to sign off in Albanian? Faliminderit. 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 See you in the next episode of our Table Talk. 